Hi, this is E. David Crawford, Editor-in-Chief, Grand Rounds in Urology. We are going to uh, have Dr. Lori Klotz, who is Chief of Urology at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and Professor of Surgery at the University of Toronto. He's also Chairman of the World Uro-Oncology Federation. Spend some time with us and give us three presentations uh, in our Platinum Lecture Series. Platinum Lectures, um, as you well know, are lectures that we uh, hear and we think, wow, these are some of the best talks we've heard in the last six months. And, and recently, Dr. Klotz gave one, and I've asked him to come up with a Klotz trilogy, which is going to break this talk down, uh, which covers uh, active surveillance and also micro ultrasound markers and a few other things, uh, into three talks, about 10 to 12 minutes each. And uh, we will have these in Grand Rounds in Urology. So, Dr. Klotz, thanks so much for taking time from your busy schedule uh, to share with the audience these uh, presentations, and I know they're going to be well received. Thanks, David. Really, it's a great pleasure to do this, and uh, it's a phenomenal initiative. So uh, this is, as you mentioned, three talks really focused around management of low grade and favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. So uh, the first part is on molecular genetics and a clinical overview of the active surveillance experience. In the second part, I'll talk about uh, the use of imaging and molecular biomarkers. And the third talk will be about patient selection, extending the boundaries of surveillance and innocuous interventions that look appealing in patients who are being managed this way. My disclosures, I've gotten research support from Exact Imaging and I'm a consult to MIR Scientific and I'll be mentioning those, their products briefly. So just a first kind of introductory comments about what's happening in early prostate cancer. Uh, and basically I think anyone who is working in this area knows that the field is on fire. Uh, the whole area of risk assessment prior to diagnosis, the use of germline analysis to identify patients at risk, the idea of modifying how we use PSA to make it simpler, more straightforward, and also to perform better using a reflex second test with a relatively low threshold to identify patients who are at risk, and then go on to imaging only in the patients who have a positive reflex test. And this is clearly coming. The integration of liquid diagnostics with imaging, the role of high precision uh, multiparametric MRI and the use of things like radio genomics, and as well the emerging technology of high resolution micro ultrasound. Uh, there's a big controversy as to who should get systematic biopsies as well as targeted. Do they need both and so on? The diagnostic evaluation of localized disease, how to use MRI, molecular imaging, do, does everyone need this? Uh, who benefits? Image-guided genetic cancer profiling and the increasing role of machine learning, big data, artificial intelligence. And finally, I think uh, a controversy and an area of investigation for the next generation really it's gonna take 20 years to sort this out, is partial gland ablation. How does this fit with surveillance? Who should get it? How do you do it? What's the best technology, et cetera? Uh, so just a little bit of the kind of history of this active surveillance concept. I was Willett Whitmore's fellow during his last couple of years in practice, and I really imbued from him this idea that cancer biology is king and that you should be humble about the impact of treatment on disease outcome, that really how patients did was much more driven by their disease biology than by uh, how they were treated. And this is his, his well-known aphorism is cure possible is necessary, necessary when it's possible. The other paper that had a real impact on me when I was Starting out came from Nicholas George, who was a urologist in Manchester. This paper is not well known, but uh, I had just gone into practice in the late 80s, and this hit me like a bomb. Conservative management of localized prostate cancer, 
There was no grading. There was not really any uh, staging other than bone scan. Four uh, percent died of prostate cancer, and at the time, I thought, "Gee, that's that's pretty good." Uh, without any treatment, uh, what are we doing to these people? And then the other influence was the late Jerry Chodak, who probably most people know uh, died uh, 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 tragically young last year. He was a incredibly talent, multi-talented individual, really a Renaissance man. And he was also a contrarian who really fought a battle against the uh, conventional wisdom. And he published this in 1994, Results of Conservative Management of Clinically Localized Prostate Cancer. Again, this was early on in the PSA era, but it, it also reported really favorable results with conservative management. But there was still this dichotomy between treating patients radically and not treating them at all. And my group in the uh, late 90s went out for lunch and assigned ourselves a mission to come away from that lunch with a plan to try and reduce overtreatment. And we came up with this idea of monitoring patients, repeat the biopsy periodically, track their PSA, treat them if they had a rapid rise in PSA or grade progression. And uh, Cyril Danju and Richard Chu, both radiation oncologists, were my partners in this and deserve credit. Uh, so what's, we had our first publication 2002, about 250 patients, five-year follow-up, no deaths. And that kind of led to a firestorm of controversy, which lasted about 10 years. Uh, and I would say a lot has changed since then. Initially, the concept was disputed. It was thought patients would die unnecessarily if you didn't treat them. I would say that concept and the idea of that overtreatment is a problem is no longer in dispute. The controversy now is how to do it optimally. Uh, we know much more about the nature of occult high-grade disease, the bad actors that result in the patients who do die after uh, being managed with surveillance, the predictive value baseline parameters like PSA density, uh, extent of core involvement, race, and age, the role of PSA kinetics as a trigger, and this is really the failure of PSA kinetics. So we use doubling time as a trigger for intervention for the first decade. We treated almost half of the men based on uh, doubling time less than three years. We've completely abandoned that. PSA kinetics is sensitive, but not specific. So uh, it does identify patients who may have higher grade cancer, but you can't rely on it. Multiparametric MRI, of course, the game changer, a robust modeling studies that show this really does work and is safe. Large registries, there's at least 10 of them now involving about 15,000 patients in total with long-term follow-up in many of them and a lot of publications. So just to summarize where the field is at, first of all, we've learned a lot from the mole molecular genetic analysis of Gleason 3 versus higher grade cancer. And it's been reported by a number of investigators that if you, that the molecular aberrations in Gleason pattern three are essentially absent in about 90% of cases. And the impact of this is a very profound understanding that Gleason pattern three is a non-metastasizing cancer. There are virtually no cases worldwide where a patient's had a radical prostatectomy his final pathology shows only pattern three, Gleason six, and the patients had a recurrence and gone on to a metastatic disease or had nodal metastasis. Uh, this has raised the question whether we should continue to call it cancer. This is an ongoing controversy. Metastasis is not a requirement for cancer. And the basal cell carcinomas of the skin and gliomas of the brain are other cancers that don't ever metastasize, but they do invade. And Gleason 6 does invade occasionally. It's a few percent of cases only. So for most pathologists, this still fulfills the criteria of cancer. And just two studies that I think really emphasize that this metastatic potential is essentially zero. The Egener study of 12,000 Gleason 6 cancers treated with surgery, two in a thousand uh, died of prostate cancer, 
And on re-review, they all had higher grade cancers in the radical prostatectomy specimen. And exactly the same story with this Ross paper, same proportion, about two in a thousand with positive nodes, close to zero, but not zero. But even in those 22 cases, all upgraded on re-review. So there you have 26,000 cases, not one case with uh, positive nodes or metastatic disease who didn't have higher grade cancer in the primary. So the, of course, every surveillance series reports that some patients with, uh, managed with surveillance do die of prostate cancer. And this is because they have coexistent higher grade cancer that wasn't diagnosed. They call this misattribution of grade. With systematic biopsies, this is around 25%. With targeted biopsies, there's a number of recent reports about this now. This is more like 10%. So it's still uh, a problem, but not nearly as much of a problem as it used to be. And it may drop further as we get better at this. Uh, in contrast, true grade progression, where you have only pattern three, and it progresses to higher grade cancer over time. After all, biology is dynamic. Uh, cells do change over time. This is uncommon. And there's three studies that have tackled this and all have come up with the same estimate of somewhere around 1.5 to 2% of patients per year. It's usually in a field of extensive grade group one cancer, and it's usually the Gleason three plus four. So you'll see in the literature, there's often statements like uh, progression to potentially lethal cancer, which I think is overstating the case. If you have a 70 year old with Gleason six, and after 15 years, he's an 85 year old with Gleason three plus four, it doesn't mean that his life is at risk. And this is our data. We're one of those three studies. And our estimate was 1% per year based on serial biopsies and Hopkins reported exactly the same thing. So just a comment about the molecular genetics. And the key point I would say is that it's not completely black and white. This is grade group one on the left, grade group five on the right. As uh, a study from Mark Rubin's lab a few years ago, you can see there are these mainly uh, loss, the, the, the uh, blue, there is a loss of, uh, gene, of tumor suppressor genes. The brown is amplification. Uh, and you can see that there are occasional aberrations in low grade cancer, but peanuts compared to the higher grade cancer. And this is a more recent study from UCSF, which defines something called the average genomic risk, a meta score of genetic aberrancy. And you see here the second line, light blue is grade group one, dark blue is higher grade cancer. This is the heat map from low genetic aberrancy to high. A key metric is 2% of grade group one were in the highest quartile. As soon as you have any elements of pattern four, it is seven times higher, 14%. So really this is like night and day, and you do get occasional grade group ones with, with bad genetics. Now my prediction is that these are on the verge of con converting to higher grade cancer histologically. You just happen to have had a snapshot when they still uh, have not changed their histologic appearance. Uh, and that explains why it is essentially unheard of to get grade group one with metastasis. 2% is not a lot, but it's not zero. And I think one clue as to why it's so rare to see metastasis with grade group one is that you need acquired multiple mutations. And this is one animal model of this. Here you had animals with either MYC activation or P10 loss. Both of these are considered to be critically important in prostate cancer progression. And basically in the animal model, with only one of these aberrations, you got 100% survival. With both, you got 100% mortality. So it appears that even though you do get the occasional aberrations in Gleason 6, it's not enough to confer a metastatic potential. Now, just briefly to review the clinical experience, which I think is pretty well known by now. There's about 10 prospective series reporting in the literature. Some of these are huge, like the Prius uh, collaboration, which is now up around 10,000 patients. 
I just want to compare the top two, which is our experience and the Sunnybrook, uh, sorry, and the Hopkins experience led by Val Carter and Jeff Tazoyan. And the reason I picked these two is because they're at the two extremes. You have our uh, inclusive approach, which included selected three plus four. We weren't too hung up about PSA below 10, and we didn't care about tumor volume of, of grade group one. Whereas Hopkins took a much more restrictive approach, one or two positive cores, basically Epstein criteria. And how did this work out? So here's our data from a few years ago. We're actually just in the process of updating this now with about 1,500 patients. This was based on about 1,000. We had 1.5% of patients actually dying of prostate cancer. And the actuarial mortality, if they had all been followed for 15 years, was estimated at 5%. So not bad, considering these were all prostate cancer patients, most of whom avoided treatment. And of course, the, this is all cause more uh, uh, survival. Uh, about, about 10 times as many deaths from other causes as prostate cancer. And then to keep us uh, from being too self-congratulatory, here was the Hopkins series, 0.5% actuary mortality at 15 years, they had basically just a handful of deaths in their 1300 patients. And then um, this is a, a more recent publication that just came a few months ago from Sloan Kettering with now around 3000 patients, 2600 grade group one, five with metastases. And the interesting thing I just want to point out here is that the risk of upgrading and the risk of treatment in their experience is superimposed. So there was no treatment in this group for uh, soft indications like a rise in PSA or an increase in grade group one volume or patient anxiety to speak of. They were, they were basically treated for upgrading. And there you see the metastatic rate kind of halfway between Hopkins and Sunnybrook. So I think this is a more uh, somewhat of a more recent experience. And uh, you can see that everyone is doing better as we learn better how to do this properly and have uh, more advanced tools like MRI and biomarkers. And we went back and looked at our series and the what were the predictors for this 5% uh, actuarial mortality. And it was basically the presence of pattern four at baseline. Now, maybe that's no surprise, but we thought we were doing the right thing with these patients. We followed them closely. We treated them with look, look like they were getting worse. We still had about 30% metastasis rate in the Gleason 3 plus 4 at 15 years, too high by any standard. So we kind of pulled back from this. Uh, this is just another series from Sweden showing exactly the same thing, that the hazard ratio for failure for the intermediate risk, which was mainly... Gleason 3 plus 4 in this surveillance series based on um, the ERSPC trial was almost five times greater. Uh, so I think there's been now a convergence between ourselves and the other extreme at Hopkins. Uh, Hopkins has now, as I understand it, opened up their criteria for essentially all grade group one and we have narrowed our criteria to be more selective about Gleason 3 plus 4. So I would say now there's a, a pretty much an international consensus that most grade group one patients should be managed with surveillance. There is a role for it for grade group two. We'll come back to that in one of the next talks. Uh, this means about a third or more of patients are eligible and going forward using modern approach with imaging and biomarkers the 15 year prostate cancer mortality is almost certainly gonna be less than 1% with this approach. So current strategy, just to summarize, initial diagnosis based on 12 core biopsy with targeted biopsy increasingly as imaging is being done before the biopsy. MRI within the first year, if it wasn't done before, you gotta wait three months to get rid of the biopsy artifact. PSA every six months, we do annual DRE mainly out of habit because it has not been much value. Uh, the key thing I think is a confirmatory biopsy within a year in all patients. Does it need to be done within one year? 
There's a nice modeling study from the Etzioni group that suggests you can defer this to year three without much adverse effect, but it does need to be done. And we now have some evidence that actually mortality is increased if patients do not have that confirmatory biopsy. We do MRI about every two to three years, depending on what's happening with PSA. Uh, I'll come back to the limitations of MRI, but it's clearly uh, been a, a, a critically important augment to the approach. And the, the rate of systematic biopsies gets longer and longer with experience now around every four to five years if MRI and PSA are stable. And really the only solid grounds for intervention is grade progression tempered by clinical judgment depending on patient age and comorbidity. Thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this.